Have you ever been playing a game with friends and found yourself shouting up into the heavens, can't we all just get along? Before they annihilate your last vestige of hope in yet another war game, hey, I get it. Sometimes it's nicer to work together with your friends and collaborate rather than just grinding each other into the dirt every day. When we work together and put our differences aside, we can do beautiful things. I believe in us. I believe in you. We can do this. Well, there's no better place for jolly cooperation than in the world of tabletop, with an entire wing of board games dedicated to the art of working together. Here's five games that we think are absolute gems in no particular order. This isn't a complete list though, of course, and we try to feature games that we haven't talked about properly on this channel before, so don't expect things like Arkham Horror to pop up. If you've got a favourite co-op game that you want to recommend, then pop it in the comments below. But in the meantime, here's number one. Everyone knows that Pandemic is one of the best co-op board games around. I mean, it still holds up over a decade after it was first released as a tense tabletop race to save the world from infection, with players medical experts working together to remove those pesky cubes and cure four diseases before too many outbreaks occur. Oh, this one rings true, doesn't it? The only problem? Most people have already played Pandemic. Luckily, the wider Pandemiverse, as nobody is calling it, is home to plenty more variants and spin-offs that offer something familiar but unique, and just as fun as the original to be worth picking up alongside the modern classic. Rather than boil the whole series down to just one box, we've picked three of the best Pandemic games that you should consider checking out if you're looking for something new. Corre el año 1840. The year is 1848. The revolution is about to hit the peninsula's coast, and everything is about to change. If you're after something that sticks closely to the original pandemic but offers some interesting new spins on its gameplay, along with a gorgeous sepia board in place of the original's garish blue map, Pandemic Iberia is the best variation of normal pandemic out there. We're not counting Legacy for a reason, more on that in a sec. Released as one of the Survival Series editions in 2016, Iberia takes Pandemic back in time to the middle of the 19th century as a deadly outbreak of malaria, typhus, cholera, and yellow fever spread across the European peninsula. The historical framing introduces an extra level of challenge to the Pandemic formula, as players must contend with the technology of the day. Rather than curing diseases outright, players must research them in order to purify water and stem the spread of the diseases before combating them becomes directly more and too difficult. Instead of being able to fly between cities using commercial flights, the players can now sail between ports or build railroads along routes, a bit like a mashup of Pandemic with Ticket to Ride to make travel faster. That's particularly important as only a handful of hospitals can be built in specific regions compared to Pandemic's many research stations, making the ability to move quickly around the map an important one if you want to win. By introducing these new options on top of a tweaked version of Pandemic's familiar loop of moving around, removing cubes and collecting cards, plus a stunning revamp of its visuals, Iberia makes a great game even better. The only downside is that Iberia is now quite tricky to track down, having been released as a limited edition. If you can find a copy though, you're in for an absolute treat. Attention all personnel. We've just received a top priority emergency request from Montreal. A massive flood has just occurred. If you're after something completely different, an often overlooked entry in the Pandemic series is Rapid Response. Rapid Response is unlike any other Pandemic game. Gone is the map board, swap for a top-down view of a cargo plane, and the small cubes are joined by bigger cubes in the form of dice, which you'll be rolling. A lot. <laughs> Rapid Response is played in real time, with the players racing against the very real ticking clock of a sand timer, or should that be gritting clock? I don't know. Rather than the metaphorical ticking clock of normal pandemic, the players just get two minutes to move their pawns between rooms of the plane, spending their dice results to create vital supplies and deliver them to countries in need. That means you'll find yourself racing between rooms to fly the plastic plane around the edge of the board to ensure that you're in the right place to deliver the necessary supplies. Then you need to gather the resources to create those supplies, move the supplies to the cargo bay to load them up, and deal with the waste that they produce, or risk losing the game, all in two minutes. <sighs> if you couldn't tell, Rapid Response can be a stressful, chaotic experience that's challenging to pick up at first. Although it plays so quickly in just 20 minutes that you'll soon have a number of runs under your belt. 
It's not a game for people who like to think through their actions first, or get frustrated when others need to stop for a second. It won't be for everyone, but if you like the pressure of racing against the clock, when it all comes together, it's a thrilling, exhilarating experience, stands out as one of the best and most unique Pandemic games around. Finally, we have the big one. Pandemic Legacy, almost as famous as its namesake by now. Pandemic Legacy is just one of the best co-op games of all time and the best Pandemic game in the series. It's one of the greatest board games ever made, according to Matt Jarvis. For those who haven't heard of Pandemic Legacy before, it takes the premise of Pandemic and expands it into a full campaign set across 12 in-game months, as players' characters battle to save the world once again from spreading disease. The legacy bit comes in the form of a permanent change that each playthrough leaves on the board, cards and even other components in the box. Rather than wiping everything clean each time you play, the map can be permanently altered with stickers and cards might be even torn up and destroyed for real depending on the group's choices and actions. Without spoiling anything, because half the fun of Pandemic Legacy is in opening each new box and discovering the surprise in store, while the game starts out like the Pandemic you know and love, by the end of your campaign, it's a very different experience indeed. Each new month brings gameplay changes, including some of the best parts of any Pandemic game, and adds fresh variety and challenge on top of the starting game. In some ways, it's like playing 12 different Pandemic variations in one box, but with your personalized character and a proper story tying everything together in a satisfying way. The first Pandemic Legacy game, Season 1, is a masterpiece by itself, but it was followed by two follow-ups. A sequel, Season 2, and a prequel, last year's Season 0, that are just as inventive, unique, and absolutely worth playing too. None of the three games are the same experience, beyond the familiar foundation of original Pandemic, and each offers hours of co-op gameplay that will keep you constantly guessing what comes next. So there you go, three Pandemic games that are even better than the original. <laughs> They're all worth playing, so if you've grown tired of Pandemic or love it and simply want even more, give them a go. You will not be disappointed. Okay, real talk for a second. This game does not get enough love. Whenever I see lists of best co-op board games and my beloved Burgle Bros isn't even on the bottom rungs of the ladder, a single tear runs down my cheek and I pat the delightful little skyscraper box on the head and I'm like, maybe next time, buddy. Maybe next time. For those not in the know, Burger Bros is a co-op stealth game in which you'll each take on the role of a unique master criminal trying to steal three priceless artifacts from a high security skyscraper full of laser trip wires, security cameras, metal detectors, and most importantly, patrolling guards. The building that you break into will have a different layout every time you play as you arrange randomized tiles face down into three separate grids, each representing one of the floors of the building. Whilst what you find in each room is entirely up to chance, you'll always have one vault and one set of stairs leading up to the next floor in each of your three grids. The goal of the game is to unlock all three vaults and haul yourselves and all three bits of the priceless treasure up to the roof where you can then escape with your helicopter. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> oh no, not quite friend, not quite. Let's talk about the guards because I really love this mechanic and it's kind of like the driving force of the game. They'll be your main antagonists throughout. Each guard is represented by one of these black meeples and a deck of cards each. The deck of cards contains one copy of every location on a floor's grid and will show you where the guard is heading when they activate. After every player's turn, the guard on their floor moves towards that location at a set speed which increases every time you need to shuffle their deck. Keep all the players on the same floor and you'll have way more people helping, but the guards will also be moving every turn. Set off alarms around the building and the guards will rush towards that point to check out the disturbance, maybe diverting their attention away from one of the players, but maybe also sending them right into their path. Whenever you enter a space with a guard or they enter your space, you lose one of your three little life counters as you luckily manage to squeeze yourself into a cupboard or cardboard box before they spot you. Your luck only goes so far though, get spotted when you don't have a token to spend and the jig is up. The building goes into lockdown and everyone loses. There's loads more fun things to talk about with Burger Bros, like the special character abilities that mix things up and come with a beginner and expert variant. 
There's the event cards that you're forced to draw from if you ever take a turn with two or fewer actions, effectively punishing you for hiding or sitting still for too long. And there's the fact that every treasure that you pick up comes with a random setback that you need to manage, like massively heavy objects making you move slower, or a barking poodle that sets off alarms in your space. Burger Bros is such a great game. It's got some really lovely visuals, some fun and frantic co-op puzzling to ponder over with your friends, and tons of replayability with big stacks of cards, random layouts, and alternative map modes to mix things up session to session. Did I mention that it comes in a box that's the actual building that you're robbing as well? And when you've gotten into the helicopter the pad, you can just put your little meeple on the, on the roof of the box and... ah, It's such a fantastic little thing. Please give it more love. Play this game, honestly. You will definitely enjoy it. It's one of my faves. At this point, superhero board games are almost as common a sight as superhero movies, and like its big screen brethren, the MCU, that's the Marvel Cardboard Universe, spans a multiverse of quality from your Let It Never End Avengers Endgames to your Christ When Will It End Thor The Dark Worlds. There's no shortage of popular game meets popular comic spin-offs. Splendor, Love Letter and Codenames have all been given the Marvel treatment, but these tend to lack the things that make superhero movies so much fun. Watching a bunch of talkative, ripped, lycra-clad wrestlers, I mean superheroes, work together to smash a massive evil cartoon Josh Brolin in the face. But beyond that, the bits of Marvel movies you probably enjoy most, if you're me anyway, this is Matt talking, aren't the CGI battle fest at the end, it's Thor slamming Mjolnir. Good luck, wheels. It's... <laughs> God damn it, Matt. It's Thor slamming Mjolnir into Captain America's shield. Miles Morales crawling around a ceiling in his spidey suit to avoid his identity being blown. Black Panther emerging from the portal first. The comic book characters that you all love are more than faceless rock and sock and robots. They're people with lives and worries outside of the end of the world. Marvel Champions is one of the few comic book board games that gets this right as well as letting you tear loose with the Avengers superpowers in suitably epic fashion using your unique decks of cards, it also lets you take a breather from the fighting by turning back into each character's alter ego. There's a gameplay reason to do this as well, recovering health and using abilities that can't be accessed in your super suit, as well as tackling personal obligations that complicate each scenario. But more importantly, it lets Marvel Champions feel like one of the most authentic tabletop adaptions of the comics and movies yet. Champions is based on the brilliant Arkham Horror Living Card Game, but it simplifies that game's investigation of supernatural horrors to a straightforward battle between the player's superheroes and a villain from the Marvel Universe. Building your hero's custom decks of abilities is also easier than in other card games with the ability to choose from different sets of cards for a fresh loadout and a combination of baddie and their villainous plot each time. While it's a living card game, meanwhile, there's lots of expansions. Extra characters and packs that you can pick up to mix things up. The core set comes with enough for up to four people to play with five different characters and three villains without needing to buy anything else too soon. But the support is there if you want more content. The Avengers are one of the best examples of a group of people working together to overcome things together. So it makes sense that Marvel Champions manages to pull one of the best co-op experiences you can have with friends. If you're a comic book fan looking for a way to fill the wait before the next phase of movies, it doesn't come better than this, even if you're more interested in the challenging, cooperative gameplay than its famous stars. Marvel Champions has plenty to offer for you, and yes, even me. Okay, I might be burying my entire ass here, but I have literally never beaten this game. Maybe I'm just terrible at it, but fair warning, this thing is absolutely nails. So if you're looking for something light and breezy, this might not be the one for you. Not to mention that the rule book is the size of a New York Deli pastrami sandwich. Long story short, Robinson Crusoe asks a lot of the player before they can start playing, but underneath all that drudgery is a survival co-op epic that has charmed tabletop gamers the world over. Robinson Crusoe sets the scene of intrepid explorers shipwrecked on an abandoned island in the middle of nowhere, as the namesake might suggest. There's plenty of scenarios to pick from that will give you different narrative and mechanical elements to mess around with, including Spooky Ghost Island, Erupting Volcano, and even King Kong. But the crux of each scenario is still hinged around one thing, surviving. 
You'll need to erect shelters, build weapons and tools, hunt for food, and keep your spirits high if you're going to have any chance of making it on this uncharted hellscape. And your teamwork is absolutely essential. Each person around the table will be playing as members of the shipwreck crew, each with their own skills and uses, from the cook to the soldier. They'll then have to combine their efforts to make it through each day and night without starving, freezing to death, being gored by a wild animal, losing all hope, or any number of fun activities awaiting you on your tropical getaway. Using a sort of worker placement system where you'll each place down a limited number of colored discs to decide on your actions, you can try to stem the tide of problems coming your way whilst also dealing with daily events and narrative choices to make as a group. One of the most interesting things in here is the kind of crafting tech tree that those playing games like Valheim right now are likely all too familiar with. You'll start with the ability to craft very basic things like a fire and a sharpened stick, but as you discover new lands and upgrade your gear, you'll have access to more advanced tools and weapons to see you through your struggles. They might give you more actions, give you some more food each day, or make you better at hunting and staving off attacks from animals. Your base could be upgraded too, with wooden palisades and better shelter against the elements. That will definitely come in handy, as well as the nights draw closer with each passing day and the weather becomes more and more difficult to shelter yourselves from. Whew. If you're anything like me, then Robinson Crusoe will beat the ever-loving crap out of you every single time you play it, but there'll always be that voice in the back of your head goading you into giving it another go. If you're a glutton for punishment, or you're just getting tired of beating Pandemic and want a bit more of a challenge, then Robinson Crusoe might just be perfect for you. Just a quick side note, there's a scenario in here called Cannibal Island, which is about burning native islanders' villages down, which feels like pretty nasty colonialism narratives. Just fair warning, but for the most part, it's your standard island fare. All right, there's one name that dominates all the public forums of board game chatter in the world, and that name is Gloomhaven. You might know it as a game that's so big that it takes an entire truck to transport it from your shelf to the table. The Gloomhaven series of games are all about adventures and dungeon crawls in a unique universe full of beastly men and strange magics. The core principle of the gameplay being miniatures on a hex-based map, using hands of cards to move around, stab things, cast spells, and pick up loot. And it all sounds pretty bog standard, right? Well, it sort of is and sort of isn't. Gloomhaven has a blend of the familiar mixed in with some really interesting and new ideas to shake things up. The chief one being how your cards are played. At the start of each round in Gloomhaven, you'll look at your hand of cards and pick two of them to play this turn. Everyone around the table will be doing this simultaneously, so you'll have to communicate to make sure that you're all getting the most out of your turn, provided that you stick to the game's rules about how much you're actually allowed to communicate. No exact language allowed, you'll have to get vague about when and where you're going. The cards themselves are split into two halves, top and bottom. The former usually filled with attacks and aggressive moves, and the latter with movement and status effects. You'll have to select one action from the top of one card, and one action from the bottom of another to build your move. That means that you're playing two cards a turn minimum, and having to form them into lethal combos as best you can. The reason that's important is because your hand of cards is very much a finite resource in Gloomhaven. You have cards that are lost for the rest of the session when you play their special moves, cards that have permanent effects and are gone until that effect is used up, and most importantly, whenever you want to regain the cards that you've played already back into your hand, you'll need to rest, which asks you to burn one of your discarded cards for the rest of the session as a cost. Your hand of cards at the start of a game of Gloomhaven is a world of possibilities, full of interesting moves and mechanics to exploit, combos to build, and damage to unleash on your enemies. By the end of an adventure, it's a ticking time bomb as you desperately cobble together as many moves as you can muster before you run out of cards, giving you nothing to play on a turn. Once that happens, your adventurer is exhausted and out of the fight until your friends either pull through to victory or succumb to the exhaustion themselves. Gloomhaven is a fantastic dungeon crawler with rich lore, campaign elements, interesting story hooks, and an absolute mountain of content for you to run through with your amigos. 
The problem is it also costs about $100 and weighs about the same as a Ford Fiesta. That's where this little trim number comes in. This is the Jaws of the Lion, beginner focused introduction to the world of Gloomhaven with a great tutorial system, less heavyweight rule book and smaller footprint all designed to gently ease you into the warm waters of Gloomhaven's fantastic card play. Most importantly, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than its older brother, sliding in at a slightly more conservative $40 to $50. It's still got all the awesome card play that you'd expect, but it's much less of a leap of faith for those who want to get into this sharp and pointy world. If you're into dungeon crawls and don't mind signing yourself up for a lifetime of gameplay, then I can thoroughly recommend the Gloomhaven series, and I suggest you start your journey in this toothy tutorial. Well, there you have it. Five amazing co-op games that we recommend here on Dicebreaker. This, of course, isn't a complete list, but there's still even more stuff for you to check out on the channel. If you're a tabletop aficionado, including all sorts of recommendation lists like this one, and a whole host of Let's Plays, reviews, live streams, you name it, why not hit subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified every single time that we put a new video live? That sounds like a great idea. You can also find us over on dicebreaker.com for our written contingent, delivering just as much fantastic tabletop content. And you can grab some exclusive merch from dicebreaker.myshopify.com. Let us know your favorite co-op games in the comments below and we'll see you on the next video. But until then, have a lovely day.